Hi there, Gordon McLean here from Learning Through Landscape. It's great to have you along to this uh, recording of our live stream webinar uh, that took place today. So we're looking at the value of loose parts play in this session. Uh, we've got a presentation from our trainer, Claire Rooney, to start off. Following on from this, we'll have a question and answer session uh, with two panelists who are Claire, who's giving the presentation, and one of our other brilliant trainers, Steve Moiser. So thank you both to them for their time and expertise that they have given us today. The questions were fielded from viewers across uh, the streaming platforms on Zoom and Facebook. They were gathered live by uh, our other group of trainers uh, that were in the background there um, helping answer and support everyone that was watching live. So we gathered the most popular questions and fielded them to the panelists at the end of this recording. So I hope you find this useful uh, and thanks again for coming along. It's great to have you. I'll see you at the end. Yeah, loads of you from both. So we've got both parents, families and educators that are today. So uh, we're going to make this stream as useful as possible for all that have come along. And thank you again so much to all of you for coming along. Uh, we're really excited to be trying a live stream today. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's new to us. Um, so I think that we've got our numbers are beginning to settle. Uh, so I'm going to, I think, pass over uh, to Claire and Steve. And just as a final reminder, please do put your questions in the question and answer function on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, then please do feel free to interact with the chat there. Um, and I will have any questions passed on to me uh, from our team. Um, so let's kick things off now and I will pass over to Claire. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, this evening. Um, maybe you're in the next day or maybe you're behind us. So hello, welcome wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us on our first live broadcast. Um, we're much more used to training face to face. So um, bear with us. We will hopefully make this as informative, engaging as it would be if we were there with you uh, in your setting. So um, I'm going to follow on from what Gordon said and share with you some slides. Okay. So, um, just to reiterate, make sure you are in the right place this afternoon. Um, we are looking at loose parts play this afternoon uh, with myself, Claire. You've met Gordon already and you have seen Steve's lovely face on the screen as well. We will be with you for the next hour uh, looking at um, some of the theory around loose parts play and um, different materials that you can use, the benefits of adopting this practice and then giving you some time for questions. So who are we? Learning Through Landscapes. We are the UK's leading outdoor learning and play charity. Uh, we also have a growing presence internationally and hopefully even more so after connecting with people across the world through this platform as well. We're very lucky that Sir David Attenborough is our patron. Um, we offer um, a lot of outdoor lesson ideas. You can find them on our website, ltl.org.uk, freely available. Uh, more in-depth guidance notes on different aspects of outdoor learning and improving your school grounds. We do a lot of face-to-face -face training. Uh, we visit school grounds and uh, look, at, uh, look at the site holistically and discuss changes that could be made. We run events. We have a membership opportunity, we do more in-depth publications, and we do get involved in funded projects as well because we are a charity and I might have something exciting for some of you at the end that you might want to get involved in. So I thought just to, to put set this in context, it was important just to um, indicate why play is so important for uh, our young people. 
it's actually enshrined in the United Nations Conventions on the right of a Rights for a Child. Article 31, children have a right to play and relaxation in basically in the way that suits them. It's, it's considered a biological, psychological and a social necessity and it's fundal, fundamental to the healthy development of our children. That's why it's so important. It's often seen as the antithesis of work, whereas actually I think we should flip that and look at it, it as play actually is children's work. It's how they make sense of the world. Um, I mean, I know sometimes playing with children can seem a little monotonous. Maybe it can seem a bit dull, uh, trivial, but actually this is children constructing their understanding of the world around them. Um, free play is, is, is the best kind of play to, to encourage. That is, it is done for the sake of play. It's freely chosen. It's personally directed. It's motivated by the children themselves. They're determining the content. It's with their intent and they're just doing it just because. So play is exceptionally important and a really good vehicle for supporting good play practice is our um, loose parts play. So the, the term loose parts has been around now since, the 19, since 1971. It was an architect, Simon Nicholson, who actually coined the term. He believed it was those loose bits in our environment, basically, that uh, empower our creativity. And, and I think of this in, in the way that, say you've got the most sterile tarmac space and there's a loose pebble there, or perhaps there's a little patch of soil, there's a stick, children will gravitate towards those loose bits. If it's that loose pebble, they'll kick it around. That stick, that little patch of mud, they'll be stirring that mud with that stick. They will find ways to be resourceful and creative. And that, that really is the essence of what loose parts is about. Um, loose parts are not specific materials. They're anything. They're anything that can be moved around, carried, combined, redesigned, stacked up, lined up, taken apart and put together in multiple ways. And I just want to draw your attention to that photograph there of those children. They are sailing in a pirate ship. Now, you, a lot of adventure playgrounds may have invested, you know, several thousand pounds in a permanent, all singing, all dancing pirate ship, which is forever a pirate ship. Those children have created a pirate ship out of a pallet, some flower pots and some sticks. It's a pirate ship on that day. But on another given day, perhaps it's an assault course. Perhaps it's a den. They're only limited by their imagination. The imagination has not been manufactured out of it. So um, sort of following on from the theory of loose parts, uh, there is a term called affordance. So, so basically what that means is um, we can perceive objects in terms of their possibility for action, the different ways that we can use them. And that there are certainly some materials that have more affordances than other. I think a classic example, and you've probably all heard the old adage of the uh, cardboard box at Christmas time being the thing that the children play with and they discard the uh, really expensive gift that was contained within the box with its batteries and its flashing lights because that has one possibility for action, whereas the cardboard box has multiple possibilities for action. The affordances of that cardboard, cardboard box are multiple. Um, I saw an amazing example of the affordances, um, the affordance of just simple blocks of wood used as loose parts in a, in a, in a school. Uh, a couple of probably 10 year old boys speaking to each other on a walkie talkie. Now these weren't, they weren't battery operated flashing light walkie talkies. These were just a couple of blocks of wood that the boys were playing with. You know, we, we can spend a lot of money on um, gifts for children where all the imagination has been manufactured out of those gifts, whereas actually those children have within them the capability to apply their imagination, their resourcefulness, their create, creativeness, creativity to very simple materials and the play is much richer for that. So I want to set you a little challenge now. Um, <clears throat> loose parts in your environment. This is just to illustrate to you that loose parts is, is a spirit. It's a practice. It's, it's not a specific set of gear that you must have. 
So I want you to look around you. I'm going to give you a, a couple of minutes and I want you to see if you can make a face out of the loose materials that are around you right now. That's one I made earlier. If you've got one, you could post it to our Facebook group. That would be fantastic. I could have been really cruel and set you a challenge just to make anything you wanted out of loose materials, but sometimes such an open-ended challenge can be quite daunting, daunting in its own right. So if you are sort of taking your first foray into using loose parts with children, then, you know, sometimes framing it and giving it some parameters can, can help them interact and then they will build their confidence and interact more freely with materials as well. So, so I hope that um, some of you have maybe managed to make some faces out of your loose materials just around you, wherever you might be, in bedrooms, kitchens, office spaces, I don't know. So I will look forward to seeing some of them. So I am going to now cover um, some ideas for what might uh, what your loose materials may comprise. This again, as I'm saying, is not a specific list, but it's to give you some inspiration for what might work for you where you are. So um, loose parts um, can definitely be natural materials. So uh, there's actually a, a growing body of evidence about um, the use of more natural materials with children, uh, more muted colors, natural textures, and the actual benefits of the fact that these materials degrade and change over, over time. Um, just consider that uh, in a classroom, for example, where it can often be overly plastic, bright colors and plastic. And if you consider that as a more natural space with muted colors and more natural materials chosen, it makes for a much better learning environment as well, actually. Um, so uh, natural materials, there's, there's evidence of children's connectivity to them. Uh, things like log stumps, um, wooden pennies, just small discs. Um, long sticks and then smaller materials as well so you know even if you've just got a small space um, if, if you're inside at the moment could you get a little basket together of some pebbles leaves um, seeds that kind of things just um, natural materials that you can get hold of and then you can even use in quite a small space as well Um, that's not to say that there's uh, not opportunities to be, ha be had with uh, man-made materials as well. So um, scrap materials and construction materials are, um, provide fantastic opportunities for creativity. So uh, in, the, in the large picture of the two boys there, there's pallets, uh, uh, traffic cones, and I think you can see the plastic backs of old school chairs, so with the metal legs removed. So it, it's really thinking, it, it's, it's a really good message in um, learning for sustainability about how we can give materials that have become uh, less useful a new lease of life as a loose part for children. So uh, tyres, which um, a lot of garages have to pay to get rid of, can actually have a lot of playable value for children. Guttering. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities there for uh, bigger scale creations as well. And that small picture in the top right, you can see that some children have hatched, actually recreated a giant cannon. Um, and the use of the guttering is, is fantastic for sort of science and technologies, um, looking at forces and motion and friction, that kind of thing. Um, so, so jumping from the really large scale scrap and construction materials, don't forget about small world play as well. And I certainly was one of those children that really loved making a small world. I would have my little people and I would create these intricate spaces for them. I would have zoos, I would have fairy kingdoms, I would have a Jurassic landscape of dinosaurs, but all in a very miniature setting. So, you know, if you haven't got a lot of space, or as we are at home at the moment, you can still start trying out a bit of small world play with children as well, and um, supplement 
some toy cars on a bit of tarmac with some chalk and see what they create there. Um, I love the picture that you can see there of those tires with grass sewn into them. So that was a nursery that had no um, green space available prior to them growing some grass in those tires. And what those tires did is they opened up small contained worlds in which the children could, could add their, their loot, small loose parts and interact. So it doesn't have to be grass growing there. You know, it could be um, herbs. It could be wildflowers. Maybe it's just full of mud. Maybe it's full of sand or water. Just different media that the children can interact with and create their small worlds and get really deep into their play. Um, another way to uh, use loose parts is to help change surfaces in multiple ways. Um, we often say this when we go into schools that are looking to um, invest, say, in new seating. And actually, how many children want to sit up really formally straight backed on their benches at lunchtime? They want to lounge around. So let's, let's give them open-ended resources that enable them to lounge around and relax during their playtime. Um, so, so things like uh, waterproof bean bags, waterproof backs, picnic blankets there, but blankets, tarpaulins, um, log stumps make fantastic uh, flexible seating. And there's a, it's probably a bit of a small picture, but you can see some little crates there that have been covered with artificial grass, which um, just some flexible seating, changing the surfaces. Um, on this slide as well, I've also said den building. Um, now that is a fantastic way to, to launch into loose parts. It's, it's quite a contained way of starting with the use of loose parts. Um, it just, you know, you can get a bit of kit together, some sticks, some ropes, some tarpaulins, and um, just encourage the children to, to den build. Um, if you are indoors at the moment, it doesn't have to be sticks and ropes. It can be string, it can be blankets, sheets, I mean, I, like the number of times I have returned home from work to a cushion den in my living room, you know, it, it's uh, <laughs> more, more times than I can count now. Great, another living room den. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's a natural innate desire for children to want to make themselves shelters. So, so let's facilitate that desire and, and let them play, let them be children. Um, Loose parts can be temporary transient materials as well. So um, we'll go back to the old cardboard box idea. Just putting some cardboard boxes out. Uh, this was a school that had a bring a teddy in a cardboard box day. But, okay, we're at home at the moment. Just, just any packaging you've got, put that out and say, what can you do with that? And, you know, maybe throw a few teddies in there as well. Maybe they'll come up with trains, castles, who knows? Just let that them get creative. Uh, so yeah, so the, the cardboard boxes are obviously very temporary. Um, there's a picture of hay bales there as well. I'm not, I'm not sure how easy they are to get hold of um, in lockdown, depending where you are joining us from. But it's that idea of just having materials that will temporarily alter a space and just they'll degrade over time, but there's interactive, interactivity through that process. Another thing that is temporary, or maybe not temporary enough in Scotland, where, we, where I am right now, is the, is the rain, the weather. Um, we, we get a lot of rainfall up here in Scotland, and um, instead of seeing it as a barrier, let's see it as a temporary loose part. Water uh, to, uh, to um, inject some, some playfulness with the water, look at the little streams that it makes, how can you interact with the water with different materials? How can we collect the water, move the water? And um, the natural progression from that in the winter, snow as well, another loose part. So just thinking about those, those temporary changes in the space that are actually prompts for play. Um, I mentioned chalk earlier as something that you can just pass to children and they will mark make. There's a tiny little picture there of a, a critter, a little creature made out of clay. So another great loose part that interacts brilliantly, whatever environment you're in, is um, just giving children some clay or some Play-Doh that they can create what they want out of and it will 
there'll be an interplay between that and the space that they are in. Um, so I, I know that many of you are parents joining us today, but there are also a lot of teachers and um, early years professionals with us as well. So um, I felt it was important just to mention that um, out, of, out of all the cost of loose parts, ironically, the storage is probably the most expensive part for you. Um, it will depend on the actual setting that you are in, the local authority, the, the, the guidelines that you have to abide by. Um, that will determine the, the type of storage ultimately that you are required to have. But it, it's worth considering, you know, these loose parts in the main, they're not valuable, they're not costly. And I mean, when I say valuable, they're not expensive, they're not irreplaceable. So if a few go wandering and you have to get some more, then maybe you can just have open bays. The, the, really, what you want to be thinking about when you think about the storage is, are we going to be putting a barrier in place that stops the children from playing with these materials? You want the materials as accessible as possible to the children. If they can get to them themselves and put them away themselves, all the better. Um, there's a little picture of a trolley there as well. So even thinking about the moving, about, moving around of materials as well, so that everything can be done by the children for the children, rather than led by adults, the children can take complete own, ownership of that. So uh, yes, we are still locked down and there are loose parts everywhere around you in your home. Going back to what I said before, loose parts play is a spirit. It's not a predetermined list of materials that comprise loose parts. So just a few ideas there to, to inspire you in, in your homes. You know, cushions, draft excluders, clothing, the rubber gloves that I would quite like back, um, the, kit, the kitchen utensils, I think that is a catapult made out of an egg poacher. Um, that's the, a portrait of Joe Wicks there made out of some um, pasta. And there's a tractor in the bottom corner made out of a bin. So loose parts, it's about injecting that resourcefulness, that imagination, that creativity that sits dormant in, in many of us. Um, it's just, it's just opening that mind, that growth mindset to seeing what are the possibilities, how, how can I find a solution to this? And those skills are really important for life. So there you go, we can do loose parts on lockdown. Um, a slight gear shift now, I just wanted to, to mention to you when considering the types of loose parts that um, you want to bring into to the environment that you're in, I always really loved Sobel's seven principles for nature play. I just think they, they really categorize the different ways that children tend to play. Um, I just find them a really strong formula for, for um, auditing what I might need in a space. So I, I'll just quickly take you through these. Um, there are other ways of auditing your space, which I'll allude to, but um, they're probably for another webinar. Um, so adventure. Is, is the first one. So it's that sense of children being able to um, explore beyond the gaze of adults, taking a few risks by themselves, seeking out unknown new explorations. So are there opportunities within the space you are in where children can be away from the adult's gaze? They can have a little bit of an adventure. They can maybe take a little risk and challenge themselves. Number two, so we talked about it with the den building, becoming at home. Are there opportunities for children to create private spaces for themselves, create a little shelter, a little hiding place for them, a den, a secret place that's just for them, made by them? Are there the, are there the materials that can encourage them to be able to do that? The third one is prospect, that when I first learned about this, it made so much sense to me. It, it's the idea that children aspire to get up high. They aspire to, to have a different view of the world. If you ever think about whenever you go somewhere with young people, 
they will run up that hill, they will climb onto that boulder, they will maybe try and climb that tree. They want to play on different levels, they want to seek out higher places. So can you facilitate, facilitate the opportunities for them to see the world, their playscape from different levels? Pathways and journeying. So this is about the fact that children don't necessarily just want to get from A to B in the most straightforward, boring, straight route. They want to go through the maze. They want to go through the bushes, through the shortcuts, make their own secret trails, go through tunnels, under things, around things. So are there ways that you can enable them to, to play that way and create these sort of pathways uh, where you are now? Number five is a very primal one, hunter-gatherer. That idea that are there small resources, natural materials, um, maybe just, just small loose parts that they can hoard, that they can find and gather and collect. Have you got little baskets or bags or trolleys or something that they can put stuff into and collect it together? It's, it's an instinctive thing. They want to gather materials. Um, a particularly important one and one close to our heart in our organization is encouraging that connectivity to nature. I know that it, it may be challenging at the moment in these times, um, but where possible, we want to facilitate children's opportunity to make personal connections with wildlife in order for them to build empathy with the, the natural world around them. Um, it, it's that idea of if you know about it, you will care about it. So we need to, we need to instill, instill these very early childhood connections with nature in order that they carry them with them into their adult years. And um, just, just having uh, plants around or, you know, even, even the ants that are crawling over a pathway or the snails that are hiding down a dark, damp, shady bit. They're, those are those simple connections to nature that, that children need from an early age. And, and finally, number seven, are there opportunities to uh, facilitate, to encourage children to come up with their own imaginative narratives about the world around, the world around them? So maybe you can do that through giving them some small world characters to, to play with. Maybe it's through having a few um, costume materials just just some loose parts that they can de derive stories around. So, so there are Sobel's seven, seven principles for nature play. There are, as I said, other ways that you can audit your space. Um, in the early years, schemas is a, is a really nice one to look at, but probably for another webinar. Um, I did just want to show you this picture of play types. Um, this is a taxonomy of play type, and I'll just let you digest that for a moment looking at the different ways that play has been categorized and thinking are there are there materials resources that you could put out for the children that you are with at the moment that that could encourage a little more of these types of play um, and and i would say at this point that um i did say at the beginning about how play is seen as the antithesis to work and often it is seen as very separate from formal learning in education settings as well. But, but play is learning. And actually, if you're playful in your learning, you're more likely to, to be more successful in your learning because we learn best when we have an emotional response and play is fun. And if you're having fun whilst you're learning, you will learn better. So I think I have alluded to the, the benefits of loose parts play all along, but um, here, here they are in black and white. So yeah, the mental benefits, we, um, they boost that creativity, they exercise the imagination. And this isn't, this isn't the, uh, the narrow sense of the term being creative through the arts. This is being a problem solver, somebody who's able to think laterally, able to problem solve, able to have that growth mindset, that open mind to, to trying things out in a different way. That is a skill for life. Um, 
they improve those social behaviors so it's so particularly you know when you have groups of children together using loose parts then negotiation skills compromising skills leadership resolving conflicts working together um, these are all really important holistic skills for our future but uh, our citizens um, there's there's no blue and um, there's no blue and pink loose parts there's no loose parts with an age category on them um, they are flexible they are there for any age any ability any background it breaks down those sorts of barriers that can be put in place there's no there's no sort of um, team colors you know it, it's it's a leveler for all individuals to interact with um, so uh, uh, following on from that all those building all those skills support positive emotional well-being and we've, we've mentioned a little bit about the fact that it does give children the ability to learn about managing risk a little more when they're interacting with these different resources and something i often pose in uh, training that i do face to face in schools is if i would just ask teachers what is school for anyway so when children leave primary school in the uk in particular what are we expecting from them at the age of 11? Where, where, where will they be? Okay, they might have some new numerical skills, some literacy skills, a certain broader knowledge from across the curriculum. But actually, more than anything, we probably want them to be, uh, have these holistic life skills built. And actually, a lot of that happens in the playgrounds. They spend, I think it's, I had a stat, 1,500 hours or thereabouts during the course of their time in, um, in a primary school in the UK. That's how much time they spend in a playground. So they're doing a lot of learning and character building and, um, and experiencing so much during that time that we want to make it the best possible, um, best possible time for them. And we want to make a space for play wherever they are so obviously we're not they're not the majority of children at schools at the moment but we need to make a space for play and good quality play so mental benefits also physical benefits of loose parts play so it encourages more physical activity um, you, you may have individuals who don't tend to engage with the sort of classic competitive sports but in interacting with these materials gives them a chance to develop their physical literacy in a way that they're comfortable with. So, you know, climbing, more jumping, balancing, and so on. Um, they also um, support the development of fine motor skills. So knot tying, you know, the fine art of shoelace tying can be supported through playing and interacting with some of these loose materials. Um, and well-being is just positively influenced by the fresh air they're experiencing. This increased physical movement, the flow of the oxygen, and the natural light as well. So I'm going to sum this up in a video now, which I think will, will, will um, really give you a sense of um, the power of loose parts. Trained eye, these materials might look like a pile of junk, but in the hands of imaginative children, these simple resources offer endless possibilities, from spaceships to Viking forts, from stormy seas to enchanted gardens. We've had tanks, we've had castles, we've had ships, we've had desert islands, um, primary sevens, once they made out they were in the rainforest. When we, we first got some loose materials out, for instance, children soon were building squares, um, building wee uh, dens against the wall with their sticks. Uh, they had a million and one uses. When we get the coins out, I saw more mathematics in the playground with no guidance whatsoever, uh, measure and estimate and what goes together and matching of shapes. Saw more of that, and my teachers saw more of that. In 10 minutes, 
than we could have done in the class from textbooks on anything to do with volume or weight or measure. They just love it. They just love using their imaginations to build all different things and you never know what's going to appear next. It's amazing what they can do. Ellie, move the wee thingy red mat. Yeah, move, blue mat. move that blue mat as move well. Children have to work together in teams to lift materials to their building site. They develop skills of balancing and rolling while learning about the properties of natural materials. Problem solving, social interaction, rule making, teamwork, decision making, creativity and imagination occur naturally as children work together. Many situations will naturally require conflict resolution, resilience and experimentation. All skills children require to learn for their life. You see a difference because they all, they all work together and it's like teamwork and they'll come up with ideas and they'll help each other out and oh, we'll do it this way, you know, how, what about doing it that way? And then they'll, it's, like I say, problem solving the, and they'll love it. I formed in wee sort of groups um, and there's always, there's never anybody left out, they always manage to get into do, if they don't want to do a particular thing they'll find their way into another wee group that's making something else or playing a different game. These loose materials are used by children in a diverse number of ways, from pretend pizzas, steering wheels to constructing dens and assault courses. Staff can use the resources to link to curricular areas, storytelling, science, maths. Children are taught how to manage these resources effectively and safely. We've got a tidy up there. It goes five minutes before playtime finishes and they're really good at tidying up. So they just follow by example. If we show them what to do, they'll go and do it. And generally, they'll we just say tidy up and then they'll go and tidy up. And they're really good at tidying up. Simple rules like a five-minute tidy-up bell make managing natural play easier and teach children to be responsible citizens. If money is a concern, you can source suitable materials by asking parents and local businesses to donate suitable items like milk crates and boxes. This helps to broaden the school community and increases buy-in from parents. Um, so I hope, I hope that um, that visual really brought it home to you just how powerful Lute's part play can be and what a difference it can make to children. Um, I'm only going to quickly talk about this slide because I am aware of the time. But um, yeah, there, there's, there's strong evidence about the, the benefits of Lute's part play. Obviously, this is evidence within schools, but be benefits that if a child is getting a good quality play experience, then whether they're in school or whether they're at home, then, then these things will hold true. So improvements in their behavior, their interaction between children of different ages, the fact that they'll settle more quickly if they've had a good quality restorative playtime. Um, you tend to find a child who is happy at school is a child who is happy during their playtime. And lots of learning takes part during play. Um, definitely a slide for the teachers among you, but I, I, I did feel it was important to mention this. Um, you know, don't see loose parts and play as separate from what's happening in the classroom because actually there is so much learning to be had with um, by um, using different materials to support that. So, you know, take maths outside, create shapes, angles measure things out to scale, whether that's dinosaurs or a local landmark, look at repeating patterns, measure things, uh, languages work, create scenes from stories. One of my favorites is just creating a crime scene for a teddy, um, using different objects to represent different sounds and words, science, um, lots of work around forces and motion, Air resistance, a fantastic way to demonstrate air resistance is just a child running with a tarpaulin. Um, 
looking at you know how can we use those temporary loose parts like that rainfall i was talking about those puddles how long does it take a puddle to evaporate how long did it take the snow to melt you know whatever the weather is are there ways that you can interact with that um social studies and uh, religious studies thinking about you know are there reenactments are there models that we can create as their role play um is there are there maps that we can create out of these materials expressive arts uh, look at big, big art attack, transient art style uh, things or very intricate small designs using small loose parts. It's like try making musical instruments, try making sound effects. Um, or how about building a stage for a performance um, using some different materials and technology. Um, you know, so much of um, the interaction with loose parts is at the heart of what you are learning when you learn about technology, that sort of trial and error, problem solving, in making improvements, evaluating your designs. So, you know, give them different challenges that way. And um, those of you who have been following us on our Facebook page may well be aware of the weekly resources that we are releasing. And this week was all about loose parts and setting you some different challenges. So we, we've not been explicit about the curricular areas that it's covering, but you can you can see, you know, if you're challenging to build a bridge that 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 hits technology, um, boredom busting, can they make a big board game outside? You know, there's lots of um, sort of language skills that could be involved there as well and creative arts, you know, it, it, it's interdisciplinary. So, so please, um, Follow our weekly resources and, and use them to support you, whatever your setting. Um, very, I think, penultimate slide. Just um, this is one, just to a few pointers to consider if you really are looking at loose parts, particularly when you head back to settings when lockdown is over. So very important just to look at the space you have. Consult widely, make sure your whole community, your whole school community or early years community is involved in the process. Think about how it's going to be sustainable, how you're going to maintain it, because those lovely materials that you get hold of will, you know, children are going to be using them day in, day out. They're not going to last forever. So how do we keep it going and how are we going to put procedures in place for their management and usage and make sure that it's safe and no, no child is coming to harm through the way another child uses the materials. Start small scale, you know, maybe it's just a bit of small world stuff in a corner or some den building materials just as a, a, a quick foray into the world of loose parts. And um, bottom there, but probably the most important thing is how are you going to store your materials because that may well be the thing that you are paying more for. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to pass back to Gordon, who has been fielding your questions, I believe. And he's going to fire a few at us. <laughs> there we go. Yep. So I am back. Thank you so much for that, Claire. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, loads of information there. So I hope it has been useful to all of you that are currently watching. Um, and yeah, loads of great information uh, about the importance of play and generally about those parts. So we've gathered a few questions. I know that the team have been busy in the Facebook comments across a few different pages, uh, answering, supporting you there. Um, but I have gathered a few from both Zoom and Facebook. Um, so the first question that I've got for you uh, that has come from quite a few different people um, would be uh, places that you could get stuff. Um, so maybe, we could have some general ideas. Where could you get some of your loose parts? And then are there any lockdown specific for those that are home? Um, so I'll give you a few seconds, but uh, Steve, if it's okay, I'll start with you. Give uh, Claire's voice a rest for just a minute or two. <laughs> but Claire, you're doing such a good job. <laughs> um, okay, um, a few, <laughs> let me think of a few tips. So um, certainly from local businesses, obviously, that's a standard one. Local business is quite popular. If you're in school, obviously parents who have local businesses, that's also a very good um, opportunity. Um, uh, bike uh, tires are very popular, but actually I found that bike tires are really good. Uh, they forget get forgotten about quite a lot. But bike tires from bike shops and inner tubes are really good as well. Um, charity shops are brilliant. 
Um, I have a couple of older boys and they have a lot of old toys under their bed. So things like small world stuff, things that they've not used for a long time. Um, I have pilfered quite a lot of that before and taken quite a lot of that into schools. Um, stuff that they've not really used before for a while. Um, different types of material are really useful as well so um if you can't get all of things like tarpaulins and stuff then bed sheets are brilliant um anything like that that basically can be used um to help create dens i guess the thing about that is that obviously tarpaulins are quite waterproof whereas sheets you wouldn't want to use those in the um in the wet weather i suppose um where else where else um uh, the, the best way i found from getting um uh, um resources from parents it's actually for parents to see it happen so if you are based in school and you invite your parents in to see the children playing the materials that often fuels their sparks their imagination gets them to think oh, actually i've got something in my shed or i've got something in my garage they're more likely to see it because they've seen it in context i think that's quite a good tip actually rather than just asking randomly they need to see it in action to appreciate its value brilliant thank you very much uh, claire have you got anything you want to add on to that Oh, Steve is so good at giving comprehensive answers. This is uh, <laughs> this <laughs> There's, there's one more actually, um, tree surgeons as well. I know that's a bit of a strange one, but um, in terms of wooden pennies, wooden stumps, that kind of thing, um, tree surgeons are, are, are pretty good. I've had quite a good response from that before. Sometimes they do cut them up and leave them somewhere and you have to go and collect them, but they, they're pretty good because otherwise they just have to chip it and, and you know, dispose of it. So. Did you mention um, children writing be begging letters to local businesses? Did you mention that? No, I didn't. That's a good point. Yeah. And there are some businesses that have community arms like B&Q and the co-op and places like that do have community programs. So that's another potential opportunity. Um, I've been to Wix before and, and walked into Wix and sort of um, um, asked for materials and I've got quite a lot of offcuts and bits and pieces from them as well. So sometimes larger businesses have have bits and pieces they want to get rid of which is quite useful and and a letter in the uh, the the ha written by the hand of a child with a with a picture is very powerful if um, you are looking to source some loose materials for free and um, linking it back into what i was saying about the curriculum there as well actually looking at gathering your loose parts and the whole implementation of loose parts as a, a learning process that the children can lead on as much as possible. So even if they can write the letters, you know, they're, they, they're using persuasive writing then to, to get a point across, so. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, so, so loads of uh, information there and ideas. I'm just going to pass on, I know this won't be uh, totally uh, useful for everyone, um, especially if you're outside of High Wycombe, uh, apologies for any pronunciations. Uh, so Alex has in the comments shared with me that Bucks, who is Chiltern Wood Recycling, um, and other counties may have something similar, uh, but there are various charities and recycling places that can be great sources for planks, wooden pallets, beams, etc., things like that. Uh, Steve, you did mention car tires and bike tires. The other one that I've seen is um, go-kart tires which are considerably smaller uh, and they smaller. can again be just add another variety uh, into the children's play so i've got um, a few different questions coming through here so i'm just going to move on to the next question if that's okay um so we've got a couple of questions we've got one here from linda asking about um sand how can you protect sand or is there do you need to clean sand uh, just a really quick answer on that one because i know that's one that's come up uh, in the past before oh steve it's your favorite good question that's a common thing we've put a lot of open sand areas into schools and nurseries over the years and that is the common most common question so the answer is basically um to create a maintenance plan and um, you can cover it but you basically need to cover it with something that has small holes in it so something that lets the air circulate and the water percolate so rather than having a hard surface the hard surface is the thing that makes the sand go a bit gross because the air can't get through and if it's not lifted off every day then it's yeah it gets a bit monkey so the best thing to do is to cover it with something like a tarpaulin or a big piece of rubber material that has holes in it and that's something that easy for the children to pull off as well so it doesn't have to be adult led it can be something the children can do um we've got a, a useful we wrote a a, a a sand guidance document that's free on our website in our resources section and that has a big 
a um, bit of information about risk benefit, but also about maintenance and simple ways to get, get past it. So um, I've only ever known one school that has taken their sand out of their grounds. Everybody else has managed to just maintain it over time. So if you want specific advice, have a look at that document because it's gathered together all the information in one place. Um, ROSPA, who are the kind of national guidance, um, you know, the, um, to protect against um, children having accidents, their recommendation is the bigger the sandpit, the better, the most unusual shape, the better, the deeper, the better. And actually, you can maintain it quite easily with the maintenance plan rather than having to necessarily um, cover it. It's site specific. So lots of information on the online sand guidance and the resources section if you want to have a look. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, just for anyone that is watching with us on Zoom, there's a lot of questions coming through in the Q&A section and uh, quite a few of our viewers have offered up suggestions of places uh, for materials as well. So just if you want additional ideas, then do check the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to, I'm aware that we've got 10 minutes remaining, so we'll try and get another few questions in. Um, so the next question, is about engaging uh, a single child. So are there ways to engage? Um, so this may be particularly relevant for those at home at the moment during lockdown. So how can we engage an individual child? I think, I think it's relevant in lockdown because obviously single children are at home, but it's also relevant in school as well because you do get those children who you introduce some materials and you get children who sort of wander and aren't really sure and don't immediately get involved and look a bit like they're slightly out of sorts and need a bit of a, a watch of the children to play to see what they're up to, to actually learn and, and be creative. Um, in terms of single children that I've worked with or, or supported when they've, when they've been struggling a little bit, I know, I know it's really difficult as an adult not to leap in there and suggest lots of ideas ideas and, and start playing with them and doing all that sort of stuff and obviously that's an important part of it but the actual initial sort of um, direction they take should obviously be child-led so um, my suggestions along those sort of lines would be would be um, a play challenge in some form so some can you know this idea this question this um, slide you can see on the screen just now with the teddy bear the, the play challenge there was can you make an obstacle course for teddy teddy's dead excited he wants to play on the obstacle course can we make a teddy bear obstacle course and it wasn't that's it was just the idea that was dropped in and then the child sort of took it and ran with it as much as they wanted to um another suggestion is to try and to link within this existing um uh, interest so if if the individual child is really into superheroes for example can you try and engage them in some way of getting excited about a superhero so could it be they could create a superhero character or or go on a journey like a superhero or something that taps into their existing excitement and the things they're enjoying um, and also variety of materials as well I think is really important so if they're not particularly physical and you know quite sort of sturdy then maybe some smaller world stuff and some softer materials and some sensory materials are more ex will be more exciting or if they are are really physical and really into football for example and sport then actually maybe something bigger and more um, substantial might be might be more interesting to them so a variety of materials so they can pick and choose and it's not all just one thing a lot of the times when we introduce sort of den building materials into school for example that's the first thing children think of but actually you can do a ton of other stuff with den building materials so i think variety is really important as well um, I, I can add to that because actually I have been in a situation where I've been in, in, engaging a single child with loose parts and um, it, it's been a learning process for me as well and I think, I, I think one of the things that probably this lockdown is teaching us is it's, it's okay for children to feel bored for a little bit and actually giving them time and space to be resourceful and I think loose parts just you know, setting them a challenge, like Steve said, but then backing away, walking away, your gaze elsewhere, and giving them that time to to just process and and, and you know switch on that creativity that um, maybe when you know in normal life they don't get that time and that space and that boredom because there's so much happening there's there's so many de demands on them and their attention is taken by so many different things so actually you know an individual child themselves in a space away from an adult gaze just interacting with some materials and and just giving them the time to to see what they come up with so yeah certainly um i've seen my individual children doing some fantastic stuff just themselves when they're given that time and freedom and space 
I once um, I once was working with a child on their own and um, they were sort of sitting looking a bit bored and we were having a 10 cup of tea and then I and then I mentioned about the fact that I was really hungry and I was just gonna nip off and get some food and when I came back he'd he'd made me a little mud pie as part of his a part of the cup as part of the cup of tea just because I'd walked off the toilet said I was gonna get some food and come back again and he'd use that comment as a as a as a sort of the, the, this frame of reference to help make something so sometimes it's just the way in which you chat to a child and the way in which you interact and and the ideas you drop in and then walk off um that help brilliant thank you again both for some really comprehensive answers there that's excellent uh, and i can see lots of comments coming in uh yeah saying that has been useful so i'm really glad about that um okay uh, aware of time, we've got a couple of people asking about risk. Um, I think that risk is, I've certainly added it to the list of webinars that we may be running um, down, down the line uh, during, uh, during lockdown. Um, so a lot of you have asked about risk. Um, I'm going to pass over to our panellists just for a really quick comment on this. There was a specific question, should you sand down all pallets when they come in? Um, but just before I pass that question on, I do want to point you towards our website. And if you go to ltl.org.uk forward slash risk, there is loads of information um, about risk um, on our website. But I think given the, the questions that this, this is probably a, a topic for another full webinar. Um, but I'll just pass over to Claire and Steve if they've got any quick comments on risk and those parts of life. Um, just very quickly for me, we've got um, uh, our loose parts play risk benefit assessment is on our, our website. Let's have a look at that as an example of. Um, and also we've got a loose play booklet on there, which also has exact risk, risk benefit as well. So I would suggest in terms of sanding down pallets, I would. That's a tricky one. I mean, pallets are the wood is pretty rubbish to be fair it breaks really easily and it's and it does have nails in I've always I've always checked pallets when they've arrived into school and made sure that there aren't any nails sticking out for example but I've never I've never um sanded down I have to say I would argue that that getting a scale for it or a, or a splinter in your finger is not really a risk as such in that sense it's it's more of the way in which the children learn to um lift the lift the pallet and move it around um, I would say it's more it's more risky to have it drop on your toe or to drop on a child if they put it over their heads for example so certainly with pallets just an example um in terms of um supporting children's understanding of Risk. One of the things we do with the children is that pallets have four corners, so four children lift the pallet. So rather than dragging it and potentially getting a scalp in your fingers or trying to manipulate it yourself, four corners, four children, easy peasy. Um, if you really wanted to sand them down, you can buy those sanding blocks from B&Q, places like that, and so the children could sand it themselves. That could be part of their play. Um, it's, it's, it's up to you. I'd say the, the nails are the things to look out for the most, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, sorry, I, I, sorry, I know I was just going to add to that. So um, in the same vein as the children preparing the resource at uh, the materials to make sure that there aren't unnecessary risks uh, with those materials. Also, having them skilled up to, to check materials over as well on a, um, a periodical basis. So, you know, having a look at the pallets and if, if a nail has become loose, that's an unnecessary hazard so you know um, them actually being upskilled to be able to judge what's an unnecessary risk to that material and then take action I think it's really important to, to obviously we're promoting free play and the idea of the children exploring themselves but I think it's important to agree some parameters for the children right from the outset and I've always done that in school so we've always agreed specific things based on that from the children and involvement with them so for example not stacking tires um, so that you can't move your arms for example so stacking tires to your waist rather than your arms being out of um, you know being stuck inside and rolling logs because obviously logs are very heavy and can hurt your back so we always roll the thick logs rather than lifting them and um, we've mentioned about the tires not tying rope around your your bodies is another one if you ask any child what they shouldn't tie rope around they'll always say your body so that kind of thing so having a list of sort of suggestions of things that that children know are risky but just as a kind of post in the classroom or on the shed outside or somewhere that basically is really obvious has that approach that consistent message that basically means all children are kind of um aware of the of the larger risks potentially but have been have been part of that process to agree that right 
Thank you both so much. I am still aware of time. So I just want to say, uh, because we have kind of begun to open the can of worms of risk there. Um, so yes, we, we, I think we would love to do another webinar. Um, certainly a lot of you are asking for it. Uh, so I think risk is going to be possibly one of the topics that we will talk about. Um, there are comments coming up and I want to stress that um, we have a lot of information about risk and risk benefit assessments and dynamic risk assessments on our website. Uh, loads of information there, but please do ensure that you are following your national and local authority and setting risk assessments if you're based in a, a school or nursery. Um, so you will need to make sure that you do follow your, your local um, policies from different counties or councils or local authorities. Um, so do just check in with that. Um, and particularly things like pallets and tires can have different uh, stipulations on them, depending where you are. Um, okay, um, so I think as we are now just past the five o'clock mark, uh, I am gonna have to wrap up the questions. Um, so I'm just gonna pass over to the final slide here. Um, and thank you all so much for coming along. I will let uh, Claire uh, speak again. You want me to finish? <laughs> uh, so thank you everybody for um, coming along today and I hope that we see you in this virtual space again soon for another webinar. Uh, get my teeth back in for another webinar. Um, if you have enjoyed today's webinar then um, please do visit our website ltl.org.uk for more information about our organisation. Have a look at our resources, um, check out opportunities that might be a benefit to you, uh, and please join our um, Facebook groups. We have one for parents and we have one for teachers. Um, you will be able to get to them from that website if you are not already with us on those pages. Um, if you do have further inquiries or you're looking for advice or perhaps you're interested in how we might do training with your settings sometime in the future, then please drop us an email at training at ltl.org.uk. And um, we have exciting news about our local school nature grant program, which is funded by the People's Postcode Lottery in the UK and um, you are able to apply for grants of up to 500 pounds for um, a there's a shopping list of outdoor learning and play resources from which you can pick included in that shopping list is a series of loose parts which have been collated by steve our expert on what is a really good starter kit of loose parts so have a look at the lo local school nature grant program and as part of that package, if you are successful in your application, you will also get a, a staff twilight training session for your school. So thank you very much again. And I will hand back to Gordon to close the proceedings. Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. So a huge thank you. I'm sure many of you will agree that Claire and Steve have both been absolutely fantastic this afternoon. Uh, and a huge thank you to all my team as well that are kicking about in social media. It's great to have you there and thank you for uh, supporting everyone that is watching. Um, it's been really good and a huge, huge thank you to all of you at home that have come along today uh, and spent time with us. We really appreciate uh, all of the viewers that we've had today and are really looking forward to the next webinar. So keep your eyes open uh, for what we've got coming up next. Um, Remember, you can sign up to the newsletter to stay up to date and check our social media content. As Claire just mentioned, we've got two really great groups uh, going on, um, specifically related to uh, supporting both teachers and educators and another one specifically for families at home. So check them out if you're not already a member. Um, and do remember to check our website, uh, drop us an email if you're interested in training opportunities and our local school nature grant. But we really look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. So please do take care, stay safe, um, and all the best.